Nice background. Oh, I thought I'd try outside. It's a. Uh, it's all right. I think we'll see if my neighbor's chickens are too loud. <laughs> they don't usually make any noise, but when I first came out here, I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> anyway, it's a lot warmer than I thought. So it is warm outside. Could have been out here earlier. Um. my papers organized Down to at least a shorter stack of papers today. I got the um, table you sent me about the groundwater advisory committee. Cool. Well, it looks like there's a pretty good Nick. Oh, Katie's on early. I take it the uh, farm outing wasn't too long. <laughs> no, I um, thankfully I heard a few parents commenting that they were sending their kids back to school on the bus. So I, um, I jumped right in on that trend. <laughs> Picnic and then see you later, buddy. But it's always easier to do when all the other kids aren't going home. <laughs> yeah. So. It was a, a nice day for a picnic though, I guess, right? It was, yeah. It's always it's good. Um, he's got like two buddies that <clears throat> they're like the three amigos. They always this little girl and this little boy, and their parents were there, so it's nice to be able to like get to know who he's thinking. But it's always awkward to me, like misbehave a little bit, and you're <laughs> just embarrassing. It's always um, embarrassing you from time to time. <laughs> well, he's, he's still little, so. Yeah, they all do it. They all take turns doing embarrassing things, <laughs> like tattletailing, and they're kind of like, I don't know how to respond to this in front of the other kid's parents. <laughs> Oh, so Katie, do you want to go first or do you want to be bumped to the end? I can go first in case it runs really long and I have to go pick him up. Okay. Um, that way I could jump off. Yeah. All right, we'll stick to the original plan. Hi, Whitney. Hello. Who's the person who called in? It's Jason. For some reason, I can't get audio through through uh, WebEx. Okay.
Hi, um, Justin, which locality are you with? I'm actually a graduate degree student. Uh, one of the requirements for this current class I'm in right now is to attend a local meeting from the city planners. So I found this one online and it said it was kind of open to the public. So here I am. So I'm right. just going to be listening into the background to kind of what's going on. Uh, so. Okay, no problem. Um, so, you know, this is pretty much the utility directors, right? Drinking water and wastewater. I don't know how I much planning there'll be. <laughs> I don't know how much planning there'll be, right? Yeah, I mean, it's planning in that sector, but anyway. Um, yeah. We won't be insulted if you decide it's not what you were looking for, but I just thought I'd give you a heads up. Oh, I appreciate it. Whose phone number ends with uh, zero zero? Could be me with the city of Suffolk because it's seven thousand. Yes. This is Paul. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then whose phone number ends with three zero? That's me, Aaron. Okay, great, thank you. That's a first for a background, Mr. Jurgens. <laughs> I don't think that's the city's official uh, background. You must be just dialing in from the wastewater side today. <laughs> well, you know, it's too hard to have dumb dad jokes because you walk all over everybody. So, uh, you know, so we got to do something to provide some humor. I like it. <laughs> How is that possible? What humor? Pillow? I can't tell what it is. Dress? Squeezy thing? I guess it'd be like a whoopee cushion or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I think everybody's on kind of early. I suspect we've got everybody or close to everybody. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see the normal thing. Uh, we're having the meeting virtually, obviously, because of the state emergency that the governor declared and we'll continue to do this for the safety of all the committee members and all that. So Got that covered. And I also wanted to remind people, um, if you are um, on the phone, 
and we have to mute you, which we usually don't. But every once in a while, we've had somebody like put us on hold and we get the crazy background music. So if that happens, um, well, Katie will probably mute you. And the only way for you to then become unmuted is to call in again. So um, I know that's a little clunky, but hopefully it won't be a problem. But that's that's the best we can do just so we don't have too much distractions or background noise. Otherwise, everybody else, you know, you just push, push the button. Um, let's see. Thanks. I appreciate it. We've got a couple more people on video. Um, it's a little helpful in the discussion. We can tell if you're bored and, you know, I'll move along faster if, uh, if I can tell. Like, this is, uh, yeah, gone on long enough, but uh, whatever makes you happy. Um, all right. So the first agenda item, and um, I'll just tell you, I did modify the agenda a little bit. Um, I sent an email out. We're going to skip one item. That's the water supply plan stuff. Um, we'll follow up with some emails and uh, put it on the next agenda. And then Ted's kind of got an extra bit on uh, their sort of, it's kind of a customer payment repayment plan program. And I thought that was plenty of things as well as some updates. So um, anyway, that's the plan for the day. Um, as far as the minutes from the September meeting, did anyone have any comments or corrections? I'm not seeing any changes. Wow. Bob, is that your real background? No. I was just curious. It's new. No, <clears throat> that's um, Lake Gaston. I'm there in my mind right now. Well, I mean, that's possible. <laughs> that's a nice day for it. All right. Um, let's see. Then we'll consider the minutes approved. Um, are there any public comments? I think there's probably not. Don't have much public. All right. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and stick uh, with the agenda. Katie's going to go next and give you a quick update on the annual report from the Ask HR Green program. And um, I will turn it over to her. All right. Thanks, Whitney. Everyone see the screen okay? Okay. Um, so it's been a little while since we've talked about, um, had one of these uh, updates or Ask HR Green Environmental Education and Outreach Program. Um, so I know it's something I work with members of your staff very closely on. Um, but it's nice to be able to um, do a refresher once or twice a year with you all to let you know some of the things that um, we have been working on. Um, so we'll be doing a little review from the FY20 um, annual report that came out a couple months ago. Um, and then looking ahead at kind of some of the initiatives we have planned for this fiscal year. Um, so just as a reminder, we have four environmental education committees that make up um, the Ask HR Green program. We have our Water Awareness Committee. Uh, we have a Fat Fills and Brief, which those two committees fall under um, your purview. And then we have the Stormwater Education Committee and the Recycling and Beautification. So all four of those committees work together under the umbrella of AskHRGreen.org. Um, and we do as much sharing of uh, resources among the four as possible for, um, you know, cost savings and efficiencies. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit about all four of the committees today, but um, focusing more on water awareness and fog um, for the most part. So <clears throat> just a little um, few of the highlights from FY20. Um, we had a very active uh, media relations program, had a lot of good PR over the course of the year. Um, we do uh, social media marketing throughout the year. We have um, a newsletter that goes out every other month. Uh, we did, uh, we do search engine marketing campaign that runs consistently um, 365 days a year to capture um, folks who are searching different topics on Google. Um, and then we also do multimedia campaigns throughout the year for a variety of seasonal topics. We had 10 of those all together in FY20 across the four committees. Um, Specifically for water awareness and fog, we had two brand new campaigns, one for Imagine a Day Without Water and one for the What Not to Flush messaging. And we'll look at those a little bit more in just a minute. Um, this is just a look at our new calendar showing the um, activity for the various committees and um, themed campaigns, those 10 I mentioned earlier. Um, we try and spread those messaging out, the messaging throughout the year as much as possible. So um, at almost any point in time, there's some active Ask HR Green 
media circulating either on the radio, on TV, um, always online, and um, to drive traffic to the website and just continue to build awareness about the program. Um, some of our topical campaigns last year um, for our stormwater group, we had a brand new lawn care and leaf um, cleanup campaign that uh, launched last fall, um, just reminding people about um, best management practices for lawn care, for fertilizing, um, having your soil tested first, um, keep lawn clippings and um, excess fertilizer out of the storm drain, uh, as well as you know leaf removal. Um, and then in June, we did a pet waste campaign reminding folks to scoop the poop because of uh, impacts for water quality um, if they don't. For our fog committee, we ran a uh, free scrimge campaign, which is really popular. Um, just the creative is so engaging. That was um, around the Thanksgiving into December um, time period. Um, that continues to be really, really well received. Um, and is done really in the style of uh, Dr. Seuss, um, but obviously the Greek French, not the actual French. And um, so that uh, that ran last um, holiday season, and we'll run again this year with the same thing. Um, and then the new creative we we developed last year was um, a what not to flush campaign, focusing on um, keeping um, trash and other debris out of the sanitary sewer system and only flushing. Um, your personal contributions. And that one I'll say was really timely with the release of it in April. Um, we had been working on that and actually bumped up the campaign a little earlier than planned, um, just due to the COVID-19 response and the lack of toilet paper in the stores. Um, you all were seeing an increase in HRSD and um, this disposable wipes being flushed, calling, causing more clogs than usual. Um, so it was a good timing to be able to have this campaign to roll out um, back in April. For our recycling and beautification committee, they focused last year on um, a waste reduction, single use plastics campaign, um, plastic bag recycling tips, keeping them out of the curbside recycling bins. And then in March, the Great American Cleanup, which ended up having to be um, postponed until this, this uh, September um, due to COVID. Um, but those were their three media campaigns in FY20. And for our water awareness group, um, I mentioned before we had brand new creative for um, celebrating Imagine a Day Without Water. It's the national awareness campaign that we have um, we have picked up in the last several years. And um, I'll show you some the new creative we developed um, at the end of the uh, presentation today. Um, in March, we did our fix a leak campaign, reminding folks to um, check for leaks, to find them, and fix them. Most of them are are easy to remedy and can help, um, you know, keep your utility bills down if uh, if you do have a, a leak. And um, for Drinking Water Week, we ran our standard value of water campaign, um, focusing on uh, how important water is into our daily lives. Um, as part of the Imagine Day Without Water campaign, I don't know why this slide's a different size. <laughs> um, but we partnered last year with local coffee shops and breweries. Um, we found their you know, natural advocates for clean water. Um, water is a major ingredient for the products that they sell. So um, we reached out to them um, locally, had coffee sleeves developed and coasters with the Imagine Day Without Water and Ask HR Green branding and information. Um, got partners to hand those out on Imagine Day Without Water as long, along with some other um, fun giveaway items for their customers. Um, in total, we were able to get 23 local coffee shops and breweries on board across the region um, to partner with us in this promotion, hand out the materials, and a lot of them also helped support the um, initiative on social media. Um, I mentioned we do a search engine marketing effort um, through Google AdWords. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on the details, but um, it is um, a big driver of traffic to the website. So when you go and search um, native plants or uh, fertilizing, um, it's likely that you'll, if you're in Hampton Roads, get um, an Ask HR Green ad somewhere in the mix. Um, so last year, that program drove um, just over 12,000 clicks to the Ask HR Green website. Um, and that's a pay-per-click campaign. So we had over 342,000 impressions, but we only um, pay for those impressions that deliver a click to the website. 
In terms of our web visitation, uh, last year was our highest um, had highest amount of traffic since we started the Ask HR Green program. So we're really glad to see an uptick in that. We had um, over 73,000 uh, visits to the website, 63,000 unique visitors, um, 117,000 page views. Um, so we're averaging about 322 pages viewed of the Ask HR Green website a day. Um, that was a 25% increase in traffic over the previous year um, and the most page views we've ever had. So we're really happy with that trend. We still see um, we have a lot of new visitors um, showing that you know people are hearing about us through the media and other avenues and coming to the website uh, for the first time. Hey, Katie. Yes. This is Ted. So the average duration continues to go down. Are, is our attention span getting lower or uh, just too much demand out there for people's time? I think it is. And I think also you'll notice that the mobile devices are getting um, our visits coming from mobile devices are um, increasing year over year. Um, so I think the fact, I think that's a normal trend. Um, and we have redone, when we redid the website a couple of years ago, we had that in mind. We, eliminated a lot of the clutter that was on our website so that it was easier for people to um, get the message once they come to the site. Uh, a lot more graphics have been incorporated into the website because of that. So graphics with text and infographics instead of just long pages of text. Um, it's been another way that we've adapted it, but um, that's why it was also important. And I think it was 2018, 19, or, or 2018, December, we launched the new website with the responsive design. That way, people coming in from a tablet or a mobile device um, have a, a good experience and the content is delivered unique to them. So there, if you're on a desktop, you're going to have a different experience than on your mobile device. You're not going to see um, as much information. Um, the navigation is um, very succinct. So again, the content um, is very streamlined for people coming to the website now. Um, we like to look at our web visitation along with our promotions and um, always see a nice trend. So when we are running a media campaign, we do see that web traffic um, is higher during those periods. Um, so you'll look and, um, for instance, in November, we had two campaigns going on plus an e-newsletter. Um, that was our most uh, visited month of the year um, for FY20. And, um, and you can see the other months where um, campaigns are running we definitely see an uptick in web traffic. So we know that word is getting out. People are um, are interested and they are coming to the website when they hear about um, the different topics that we're promoting. Um, Google organic search is the number one driver to the site. So that's people that are just searching um, and clicking on um, our natural search results, not the paid. Um, so that 36% of our traffic comes in that way. 25% is direct, which is a you know, so one quarter of the people have either heard an ad and have typed in Ask HR Green directly um, or know about the brand and have come to the website on their own um, just by typing in the URL. And then um, another 22% are coming from our paid efforts, like our search engine marketing campaign um, and our digital media campaigns that run. So I mentioned we had a really active media relations program and um, a lot of great um, articles featured in the news and um, interviews with local media stations. We had um, in total 19 in FY20, um, two op-eds that we ran both in the pilot and the daily press. One was for Imagine Day Without Water last year and the other was for Earth Day 2020. Um, we did 10 news releases all together and six of those um, every, uh, every other month newsletters that we issued um, and our e-newsletter subscriber list is up to um, about 6,500 um, as of the end of FY20. So we like to look at our uh, the numbers. You all might appreciate this more than some of my other audiences, but um, so combined, we had about $7,000 budget. That's between all four of the committees. So they take a portion of their media budget. We dedicate it to PR. Um, the firm that we use for all of our creative and advertising support has someone that's dedicated to helping us get our um, our information in front of different media outlets. They do a lot of calling and follow up um, with different media outlets for um, the different initiatives we have. So with a $7,000 budget, the publicity value of all the 
Um, interest we got last year was just under $100,000. So a 13.7 return on investment there. And we were just really, really pleased with, um, with our public relations um, results from FY20. Looking forward to doing that again this year. We have a really active social media marketing campaign. Um, Rebecca Estep, who has been at these meetings before, you um, recognize her. Um, works really hard on our social media platforms. Um, she's really good at keeping the content fresh and we're seeing a lot more engagement there um, from our audiences. Um, we post information there, but also try and keep it as interactive as possible. Um, and um, to keep content as fresh as can be, we do um, a lot of event postings. We share content from a lot of our partners. Um, and some contests along the way that, um, that definitely help with engagement as well. We have a Green Living blog on the Ask HR Green website that um, she also helps to keep up and running to keep content as fresh as possible. This is also a place where some of our locality members and HRSD committee members will contribute blog content. So it's a place where we can share local news and information about something going on in, in one locality or just general um, green themed content that is engaging and interesting to read, not necessarily uh, dictated by one of our, you know, media campaigns, but just something that's topical and seasonal. We had 33 articles last year um, covering just a variety of, of environmental topics. We typically have a really active event schedule, and that was no different last year. Um, it's just that the last half of the year or a quarter of the year, they all got canceled. We were able to make it to about 19 events. Um, we had 12 that were also planned for the spring, which is really a busy time for us. Um, and those, um, um, but in, in total for the 19 events that we were able to attend, um, we had estimated attendance of over 86,000. Um, so it really is a great opportunity to get Ask Future Green in our, um, our different, from, uh, promotional messages and um, promotional items into the hands of the public when we attend these events. So we're hoping that FY20 will turn around at some, or FY21 will turn around at some point, we'll be able to get back to some of these events. We have a couple scheduled for this fall um, that are outdoor, very socially distanced um, opportunities that we will be attending, but um, definitely not the schedule we're used to. Um, I think the Ask, Ask Each Your Green trailer, if you're not familiar with it, um, we've had that around for many years back from HR, HR wet days, and it's had two or three new wraps now at this point, um, but it's still in good condition, even though it's 25 or so years old, we keep it stocked full of our giveaway items that are really popular, our reusable bags, shower timers, um, we have um, sink strainers that we hand out for fog, grease can lids, we have dog waste bag holders for our stormwater group, so um, when people have come to know what we're doing with the trailer and um, will seek us out at different events, I think this one um, picture here was from Suffolk Peanut Festival last year, which was canceled, unfortunately, this fall, but hopefully we'll be there in 2021. We have a few grant programs um, through Ask HR Green. Um, so our environmental education mini grant program is going very strong in FY20, the 21 mini grants. Um, so that's where Folks working with um, youth K through 12 can apply for up to $500 in assistance for their environmental education um, project. So it can be a teacher or a youth group leader or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. We've even had individual scouts working on like their um, Eagle projects that have submitted um, their project for funding in the past. But uh, FY20 was the biggest year since I've been involved with the program. We had, like I said, 21 grants that were awarded over $10,000, um, and that was spread across um, 8,000 students in seven different localities. Um, we have had a few of those projects had to be postponed due to the timelines and COVID, um, so they've been carried over into this fiscal year. Um, and we've had a bit of a slow start this year with projects, but we're trying to, um, trying to reach out to teachers and encourage them to maybe think outside the box to see how we could still support um, their um, efforts to submit the mini grant program this year. Um, we actually had a really nice article in the pilot last Saturday um, from um, a reporter who was doing a little profile of our 
um, education guides and also promoted the mini grant program. So we're hoping that maybe we'll get a little uptick from, um, from that publicity. There's also a pet waste station grant program um, that's run through our stormwater education committee. And that's where neighborhoods can apply for a free pet waste station um, to install and maintain in their neighborhood to encourage people to uh, pick up after their pets. Last year, we um, awarded and installed 25 of those. Um, and since the program launched, we have uh, done a total of 517 across the region. And that's a program that started in James City County is a great example of um, a locality doing something that really made a lot of sense and we were able to take it to the region um, and help to administer it through the PDC so that everyone in the region has access to it. The Based Our Homes program is another uh, program that started locally in the city of Norfolk. And um, a few years ago, we also opened this up through the PDC to um, the entire region. So there's an online form now through the Ask Each Our Green website where folks can take a pledge to do um, a number of green um, themed behaviors, everything from conserving water to um, you know, conserving electricity, using reusable shopping bags, um, having their soil tested, installing rain barrels. Um, they select, I think it's a crate from a criteria about eight um, behaviors in order to sign up for the program. And they get um, a Bay Star Homes flag to display in their yard. And they're um, added to our distribution list for, um, for e-newsletters, for events, and other green um, activities that might be of interest to them. So we have just over um, 3,300 of those um, in, enrolled so far, and that number continues to grow. Um, and then two years ago, we opened that um, program up to our local businesses as well, just expanding it to based our businesses. And um, we've had so far to date 50 businesses have enrolled um, as a based our business partner. Um, so there's a different criteria for those businesses. Some of it is um, related to fleet maintenance or um, green practices in their, um, in their landscaping, um, you know, organizing a green event or a, a collection event for recycling, um, you know, participating in a community cleanup. Um, so we try to make it as easy as possible for both residents and businesses to be involved in these programs. It's again, just pledge based. So we're not checking behind folks, um, but it's just a great awareness. And, um, you know, there's something with taking a pledge to do um, and receiving the recognition through the flags and the business decals. Um, that people feel good about doing the right thing. So we, um, across all four committees, we like to, you know, just total up our um, impact from our advertising impressions. We had um, just under 15 million altogether through radio, online, TV, um, you know, through our search engine marketing. We do advanced TV streaming ads as well. Um, almost 300,000 views of Ask HR Green videos last year, um, 32,596 clicks to the website. Um, a big increase from last year from um, our ad content. We're doing more and more video um, whenever we do a new creative campaign. Um, and so that certainly is what uh, seems to get more attention these days um, in terms of ad creative. When you add all of our media budgets together across the four committees, as well as their creative budgets to develop the ads, we had about $176,000 budget. Um, we got an additional added value to that media from the different outlets that we partner with of 72,000. So that puts our total exposure value at 338,000 for the year. Um, and when you compare that with the budget, it's a, a 1.91 to one return on investment there. We feel like we're getting a lot of bang for our buck. Um, our media partner with Red Chalk Studios um, does great work creatively and um, has a lot of buying power when it comes to media campaigns. They get a lot of um, um, earned media opportunities um, in addition to the PR support that they give us, um, which is not included in this number. Uh, we're really pleased with um, how the numbers hashed out for FY20. So I wanted to just look um, ahead of what we have planned for this fiscal year now that we are well into it. Um, we just are wrapping up a lawn care campaign for the Stormwater Committee. Uh, we did a PR campaign for our Great American Cleanup through the Recycling and Beautification Committee that was um, planned for September 18th and 19th. 
Uh, we just got the results in for that. We were really pleased that even though we weren't able to um, do a lot of large groups um, in these cleanup events like we've done in years past, um, it was promoted more as encouraging people to sign up to do their own small group cleanups, family gathering, you know, grab their family members and go for a walk in the neighborhood, uh, maybe pick up a, a place in the community that you know needs some help. Um, so in total, we had over 600 volunteers that um, showed up on the, um, in the last part of September to do these individual cleanups. And I think it was 13,500 pounds of litter were removed altogether um, from that cleanup effort. So um, we also have Imagine Day Without Water that's coming up October 21st. Um, so we're gearing up to do another media campaign with um, with the creative we developed last year. Plus, we're adding um, a new part to that campaign for social media, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, again, we're running our Grease Grinch campaign this holiday season and uh, working on a new um, recycling outreach campaign to kind of get people excited again about recycling and help to dispel some of the myths that are out there and hopefully... Um, start fresh and improve recycling habits and um, just knowledge across the region. Um, that is a work in progress, and we're um, excited to be launching something in the start of this year for that. Um, we'll also be running the What Not to Flush campaign again. That um, is definitely an evergreen campaign, and we could run it all year long, and we do promote the messaging all year, but we are planning um, another paid media um, campaign for that in February. So for Imagine Day Without Water, October 21st, right around the corner, um, we um, developed a new, um, basically like a thank you to our essential workers. Um, we're calling it our Lover Water Workers, um, hashtag Lover Water Workers. And we have a, a fun video that we've developed that we'll be promoting on social media and that um, all of our partners through Ask Age or Green will have um, the resources as well to promote both on your websites and your social media channels, but also just internally to your staff members. Um, hopefully it will be a bit of a morale boost. Um, and we know that you all have been working around the clock, um, probably getting a lot less credit than some of our other essential workers. So we wanted to um, take this opportunity to, um, to just acknowledge that and we'll do a fun little giveaway on social media as well um, as a thank you. Um, for that, and I'll show you that video here in just a minute. Uh, for our fog committee, it's a little less glamorous for them this year. They are hard at work on some updates to our regional fog program. So um, the regional fog model ordinance that was developed, I think it was 2008. Um, it's just been a, uh, a long time since we looked at that as a region. A lot has changed since then. They're working on some proposed updates, which I'll be talking with you all about, I think, at the November meeting. Um, that's what we're planning for for now. Um, we're also uh, looking at changing um, the guidelines for the Hampton Roads um, what is it? technical standards for the sizing of breeze control devices. We did update that a little bit a few years ago, but um, there's some more extensive updates that they have been working with the consultant on to just keep with best management practices now in the industry for um, prevention of fog in the sanitary sewer system. So I'll have a lot more technical information to share with you on that front at the November meeting um, with some help from some friends who have more <laughs> are more in the trenches than I am on that front. Um, but that is a big effort for them this year in, um, in terms of their, you know, commercial outreach efforts working with um, FSEs in the region and their enforcement programs. So about that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I did want to show you just a few of the videos that we've developed over the last year. I mean, you all probably don't get an opportunity to see the creative that often. So I thought it would be fun to just to show you a little bit of that and before we end. If this will work, sharing video on WebEx, I don't think I've done it on this platform before. We'll start with the, um, let's see. This is hmm. 
Do you see a purple screen? You do. Okay. It's weird that it didn't pull it up for me online, but all right. So this is the Imagine Day Without Water new creative we developed last year. Um, sounds really a lot like Morgan Freeman voiced this for us. So I'm going to just leave that to your imagination. Let you know, think if we actually were able to hire him or not. But um, but he sounds an awful lot like him. I turned on the faucet. No water came out. No dripping. No bubbles. Not there was no water. No water at all. The tap was as dry as that belly sea ball, which meant no showers, no scrubbing, no flushing, no rinsing of hands, no every brushing, no washing of socks, little red boxes. The dishes stayed dirty with three of boxes. I couldn't make coffee. No water to make it. No cup of joe. Don't think I could take it. If we had a fire, the cow would quench it. Without any water, we just couldn't drench it. What about hospital, business, and school? Would they put it? This evening, can you hear me? Plain crazy. A waterless day. I just can't imagine. I'm in great dismay. Our water yeah. waste water system of pipes deserve our support. Our yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Let's all love our water and learn more about it. Ask yourself, where would we all be without it? To know more and be water aware, go to askhrgreen.org and then I turned on the faucet. So, um, that was a managed day without water from uh, last year. We'll, again, we'll be running that again. Um, there's a radio ad that mimics that um, audio track that will run on the radio. We'll be running that on, on digitally, YouTube, pre-roll videos on social media, um, as well as some online streaming. Um, so where people do the, they stop subscribing to cable and they watch their TV online now. They're, um, we have the ability to place ads and their streaming services. Um, and so that's really helpful because people have to watch them in order to get to the next um, episode of whatever it is they're, uh, they're currently, um, what's the term when you overload on episodes? I don't watch enough TV. I'm a four year old. Binge watching. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I haven't watched TV in a few years and unless it's um, something for preschoolers. So um, I'm going to show you Another um, What Not to Flush campaign that we launched um, last year as well, uh, or this past April. Your toilet's not a trash can or a place where you toss cotton swabs, paper towels, tissues, or floss. And what about so-called flushable wipes? The answer is no. They get stuck in your pipes. And now that you have a big problem with plumbing, that problem keeps coming and coming and coming. Clogs leak to backups that make a big mess in your home, in your neighborhood. That is unless you don't toss in tampons, cat litter, or trash. Not even a goldfish gets flushed with a splash. Toilet paper is one thing that can go in the loop, as well as the obvious, number one and number two. Just your personal business. That's it. No more. This message is critical. Please don't ignore. Just your teepee and your pee and your poo should go down the bowl. All else is taboo. Go to askhrgreen.org in a rush. That's where you'll find what not to flush. Your toilet's not a trap. So that's another a great example. I think for Red Shock hits a home run with what can sometimes be a difficult topic to talk about or promote. Um, they make it very engaging and um, the way that they are able to do the creative and a rhyming style, um, engaging music, it just um, makes it a delight to watch. And um, these videos do very well. So I'm gonna show just that I mentioned before, um, we're working on just a social media outreach campaign for Match Day Without Water this year. So this is a video that will just run on social media platforms. Um, and it's just a thank you to our essential water workers. And that'll be the last one. You see the blue screen now? Okay. I don't know why it's such a great one.
So that one doesn't have like voiceover text. It really is designed for social media, which is why it's more the reading on screen text. But um, and that uh, you probably noticed featured some of your employees. We worked with our water awareness committee. We got Newport News, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake too. I think we're all able to send in some some clips of some actual employees um, that we were able to include. And I think we stole the video from a video Norfolk did recently. So thank you for that. Um, but just really pleased with you know how it turned out and um, looking forward to sharing that um, in the next week or so. And that's all I had to share with you today. But again, happy to answer any questions about anything you might have. Thanks, Katie. That was really good stuff. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to work on it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I feel like we have we have the best campaign in the state. Certainly, whenever Katie goes out to speak to the bigger audience, there's lots of uh, lots of people with questions and uh, hoping to copy some of these initiatives. So it's nice to have such a strong program. Hopefully, um, and and we just want to encourage you. I feel like we always forget to say just I don't we don't know how much there's like kind of um, discussion from the people who serve on like the fog and the wet committees. Well, I know we don't call them that anymore, but um, to y'all. So if there's anything we can do to help bridge that gap, if, if you have questions, let us know. So. And like she said, we have lots of fog to talk about next month. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to the next thing. Um, we just wanted to do a quick um, kind of FYI on this um, EPA guidance document on they call it they're calling it financial capability assessments. Um, for a while, we spent a lot of time talking about affordability and how the metric that the EPA used, which basically sets the schedules right for like consent decrees, was um, was pretty simple and, and missed a big issue. Um, you know, that was like focusing on um, the median household income and what percent of their income they would spend on a utility bill. So here is their staff at, at trying to make the the assessment more robust. And um, I'm going to let Katie go ahead and hit the highlights. Like again, I said, we, we want to keep this simple. If you're really interested, there's um, a nice big report and actually a pretty good webinar um, to get more details. So Katie, you ready? Yes. All right. Yep. And um, like Whitney said, uh, there is a 75 page report on this, as well as a 30 minute webinar that the EPA put together. So I am not going to be going through the whole 30 minute webinar. I really didn't think Thank you all you. would want to listen to me <laughs> talk for 30 minutes about this. Um, so I'm going to be giving a very brief overview of um, what was said in that webinar. So a little background, let's see if we can get this to move. There we go. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is a little bit of background on the program, what their proposed, um, the proposed assessment's going to be, and then also what EPA is looking for with public comments. So this, what came about, um, the EPA worked with the National Academy of Public Administration to kind of create and update a better framework that uh, reflects community affordability. And so this guidance includes new metrics, and they're hoping that it will um, more accurately reflect how much low income communities can afford to pay for water infrastructure upgrades. So the way it works is there's two alternatives. So a community would choose between one of the two alternatives to submit to the EPA for assessing the community's financial capability. And then as op an optional addition, the community can also submit um, additional metrics that uh, the EPA kind of lays out how to submit them. The way that 75 page document works is that the, the first part is the proposed 2020 financial capability assessment. And then the old assessments, the 1997 and the 2014 assessments are added on as appendices. So when this is all done um, and finalized, the EPA expects to use this as a way to support the negotiations of schedules for implementing Clean Water Act requirements. So we're going to start with the first alternative. The first alternative um, has four different um, metrics that the EPA goes through or the community would go through. 
The first two, the residential indicator and the financial capability indicator are from the 1997 financial capability assessment. And the EPA doesn't really go over them at all in the proposal. They're just kind of assumed that um, people know what those are. So the two that they focus on are the last two, which is the lowest quintile residential indicator and the poverty indicator. And so those are also the two that I'm gonna just briefly give you an overview of. So the lowest quintile residential indicator is basically a, a table that you fill out. It's a simple calculation. Um, the first, basically what it's saying is that low income households typically are have less people who reside in them than a median household. So therefore their annual bill is also lower. And then their annual bill as a percentage of their income gives you the overall lowest quintile residential indicator benchmark. So that's that one. The next one is a poverty indicator. And so how this works is that um, the community would go through and score themselves on each of these poverty indicators and then take the average of their scores and that'll give them the overall benchmark. Once they're able to get all of those indicators, then they put them into different matrices. So the 1997 results from those calculations are put into the first matrix. And then the new 2020 proposed results are put into the second matrix. And then the results of those matrices are put into a um, expanded financial capability matrix. And the results of those matrix of that matrix can then give you the recommended schedule benchmarks. So that's the first alternative. The second alternative is a lot easier for me to explain because really it's it's up to the utility. Um, you all decide what rate or financial model you want to use. You document it and you explain it um, and you hand it over to the EPA. That plus the poverty indicator, which was that table of five different um, indicators that I showed before. And so this one is designed for communities that may have more expensive Community uh, Clean Water Act obligations, um, just because it gives a more sophisticated evaluation of affordability over time. So the different, one of the big differences with this one is that um, the EPA doesn't have benchmark percentages of household income or a designated schedule based on the outcome of this model. So it's up to the community to provide those, but the EPA like reserves the discretion to say, you know, we don't want to the schedule to exceed the useful life of the community's water infrastructure assets. And they also want the utility bills to be within reasonable bounds. So those are the two alternatives. And then as an optional additional metrics that you can submit there, they have a whole list of things that you can submit. And um, I'm not going to go through all of them, the one that I did want do want to point out is the customer assistance programs. So we've talked as a committee before that we are going to be collecting information on the customer assistance programs that the um, region is starting to implement with CARES Act fundings and in response to coronavirus. So I just want to say that there is more to us. This is useful for everyone to be collecting this kind of information. So the requests for comments are due on October 19th. The EPA has a whole list of page of uh, questions that they're asking for uh, comments on. The uh, link to the EPA docket can be found on the slide here. And then also the webinar, I have a link as the last slide in the presentation. So I put that Dropbox link into the chat box of the WebEx if um, you didn't get the email. So the 30 minute webinar and then the, also the 75 page document is also here if you guys have questions. So if you have any questions, um, let me know. All right, so uh, we might put some comments in. I'm, I'm gonna have uh, the, our economics department just look at some of the more some of the questions that are more in their wheelhouse, um, you know, some of this, they ask questions about like what other data is available um, to look at um, sort of assessing affordability and uh, financial hardship. Um, and then also maybe look a little bit at the methodology. One issue is um, trying to estimate the household size of the low income quintile. 
and uh, and looking at the poverty indicators. And um, I kind of wanted to ask y'all, like I said, I don't want to spend too much time on this, especially if you're not super interested, but um, one of the assumptions they sort of baked into this was, let's see if I get this right, that that a low, the low is quintile, sorry, household size was about 70% of the median household size. And then they take that and say, then the the water use and the bill will also be proportional. So 70% of the median household income size. It is, do y'all think that's true? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I think that needs a lot of thought and research. You know, I think first glance, I thought it would be really off, but then I thought, again, you take the overall population of low income, which a lot of, you know, if it's just basic household income, it would be skewed to elderly that are living on their own or just a couple. So it's possible, but I never really gave that a lot of thought because the other spectrum of that, I think we've all talked about this, is they tend to, the lower income tends to have you know, leakier fixtures, less improvements to the the building. Um, so they protect, I would think they would be on the higher water use, predominantly a family that's a, a typical low income, but I don't know. And a lot of them, to Ted's point, would be living in rental units where the tenants are paying the bill and the re the landlords, bless their pee picking little hearts, don't have a whole lot of care factor in fixing leaky utilities because it doesn't cost them anything. And and I know we all fight that battle pretty regularly where tenants call us and say, I can't get the leak fixed and it's the landlord and, and we can't get in the middle of that. So, I, yeah, that takes a lot of, I agree with you, Ted, exactly. That takes a lot of analysis because there's parts that go both ways. That's been our experience as well in Virginia Beach. Um, back before Gaston came online, when we were working pretty um, uh, closely with um, apartment communities in Virginia Beach, we saw that some of the ones that were um, Section 8 eligible um, tended to have the, the lowest budget and resources for for maintenance and the highest per capita consumption. In fact, we we worked with um, a couple of those properties trying to get new fixtures in there and and um, working with their the few maintenance folks they had to to um, um, get some of the toilet leaks fixed. But that that was was exactly our experience is that um, you know oftentimes um, you find the highest consumption in those those lower income settings. So, but I appreciate the com comments. It's um, it makes a lot of sense to me. But then I also wondered how you would do a better, simple me methodology. <laughs> they would let you, you know, um, good question. Your local data, but I'm assuming most of y'all don't know um, consumption compared to income, right? So, you'd have to make some uh, some assumptions. You know, you could probably do some of that analysis with somebody who has a really, really big analytical brain. When you take census data and, and narrow it down to your to your block census blocks, and com you could probably do some of that. I'm not smart enough to do it. I know that for sure. I think it's worth a comment, Whitney. And I, I'm thinking that you know, if we really wanted to turn our regional GIS folks looking at you know, trying to take the census tract data, like Dave was saying, look at um, income by census tract and then water consumption consumption by census tract, you might be able to chip away at it. But it's, I think it's worth a comment back to EPA on this, just to say, you know, maybe to validate that or show that, you know, how they came up with those numbers. Okay, and um, Dave, you know, it. I feel like there's some staff at the PDC who might want to play with that, but what we usually don't have from you all is water use by census tract. And so um, we just have to figure out if, if that was available and uh, then, yeah, we could play with it. So. I think we can, I think Jules can probably get you something that might work off of our billing file. And um, I think he's tied that pretty much to the premise addresses. So I think there is. 
an ability to tie um, meter information to the premise address and, and then draw the polygon around the census track or whatever to make it work. Okay. Cool. It, it's definitely doable within tying the GIS with the customer information system data. It's certainly doable. All right. Well, we will add it to our wish list of work program themes. Um, the other one I wanted to just flag is the um, the poverty piece. Um, they have five factors. Again, I just wanted to do some quick feedback. Um, I don't know, Katie, if you can pull that up. But what I thought was interesting is they have five factors and um, they kind of say, does your community fit in the lowest or highest 25%? Like they're unusually sort of poor or stressed or not at all. And um, and each one of these gets this, like a point kind of you average them, which I, I thought we might want to comment on, or at least I could send out some initial comments and you guys can give me some feedback. But like the first one is, um, let's see. Gosh, I can barely read this on my screen. Let me see. So look at my hard copy here. The first one is um, the percentage of population with the income below 200% of the federal poverty level. And then the next one is just the percentage of population below the poverty federal poverty level. So like, it seems like these things shouldn't be equal. Has anyone else looked at this? As to which one you know, sort of would be the most significant in terms of a stress? All right. Well, I, like I said, I might mull this over and if I have a suggestion, I will send it out for y'all to look at. Um, but, you know, I know this isn't, it's not critical for us to comment on in the sense that right now, um, you know, the HRC's consent decree has already kind of been worked through, but we never know how long this guidance will last and when it'll come back um, to affect everyone. And I think the better we can make it, you know, and the more, you know, thought goes into it, that um, it's just good policy. So um, those are the two things I wanted to mention. And then, um, and more generic stuff, I thought we might want to make a comment um, supporting the inclusion of, of drinking water um, bills, the cost of drinking water, and then also um, stormwater in separate systems. Um, that is mentioned in this guidance, but that's one of the things they ask for feedback on is whether or not they should just be looking at basically the cost of combined sewer systems or they should have a broader assessment. And I, I think we've already been down this road and, you know, when somebody's paying this bill, especially in Hampton Roads, it's often everything lumped together. So, all right, well, jump in if you have any more comments or we will move on to the next thing. All right. My papers. Okay, next up, uh, I have listed as a swift update. There's a couple parts. I think first, Ted, do you want to go first versus Dan? We will talk about the. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to try to Thanks. share my share that screen, and we'll see what happens. Somewhere. I thought I'd give you a quick update on what we're doing on SWIFT, where we are schedule-wise. I'm not getting that to come up. Hang on. Well, while Ted's doing that, I'll just uh, remind everybody on the water supply stuff that I skipped over today. Um, we just want to send you out as a, a simple a uh, um, data summary as possible that sort of says what was in the original water supply plan and then how did the supplies and demands change in the update in 2018. Um, and that's sort of a precursor to the review of the state water resources plan that's coming out. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, we just realized that we had, um, well, they had my old notes that turned into sort of our formal documents and they're just, they're kind of hard to follow. So hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate the extra time and Simplicity. All right, we ready to go? Are you seeing something? I am. Are you? 
I am too. That's good. Okay, cool. So this was a uh, presentation that was given to the uh, the oversight committee in September. I'm just going to run through it because it has the pretty much the most up to date information of where we are. Again, this is where we're tracking for the facilities that would actually have um, swift recharge at each of these facilities long term. At one time, we had talked about um, seven facilities. We're down to five, and uh, we're going to combine flows at a couple to make that happen. Hey, good luck reading this. Um, hard even on my screen. This is the overall schedule. So James River is first. Uh, and hopefully you can see my cursor that's at the top. The top block is nutrient reduction improvement. So we're, we found upstream of all the swift work, we've really got to tighten up our nutrient reduction to get very consistent, um, very low levels of TN, so below four. And uh, so a lot of that work happens in this first part of this. We're at, we've combined all that with our SWIFT facility at James River. So this combined project is somewhere in excess of $300 million. And uh, we, we're working with a design build team now. So we're down here in this uh, design selection timeframe. Hopefully uh, be able to select the team and, and award that contract early next year. And they'll start working shortly after that. We've been working hard with City of Newport News over some land issues uh, surrounding our plant. We're getting a lot of getting close, I think, to a deal there that's um, beneficial to both parties, I would hope. Uh, so that one's moving along. Uh, that's, that's James River, and that'll be roughly 13 to 17 million gallons a day of uh, swift recharge at that facility. We would move to Boat Harbor next, which is the facility, the treatment plant just at the bottom of the peninsula. For those who aren't familiar, that's the one right as you go into the Monitor Merrimack. And uh, we're moving that flow across the water to Nansenman. And so we're, we will be doing uh, moving the flow across and, and doing the advanced nutrient treatment in Nansenman during this block. And then the SWIFT facility at Nansenman actually isn't done until 31. Uh, we do work in, in Norfolk at the VIP plant, which is the one behind Old Dominion in this block of time, starting sometime around uh, where we're in early planning now, but we'd actually be working uh, some point in the 2023 time frame with that finished in 31. So the next actual swift recharge facility is at York River, um, and that would start in the 22 time frame and be done in 28. And then finally, Williamsburg's at the bottom. Again, we had some property acquisition issues there we're still trying to work out. And that's the smallest facility that's only about 8 MGD. So this is roughly the, the path we're coming online. James River, uh, York River, then uh, really Nansman and VIT will come on about the same time as far as recharge goes and Williamsburg's at the end. This is where we are on James River. And as I said, we've, um, we're in this proposal phase. We've received proposals and we're evaluating those from two design build teams and expect to make a selection by the end of this calendar year. This is what the James River treatment plant uh, property is today. Uh, we're, at, we're working with Newport News to acquire this piece of their park. Um, we're putting six wells out in the park area and we're working with them on that. There'll also be four wells uh, on site itself. Uh, so it's a continual process with Newport News to uh, really find ways we can improve the park with their, uh, in cooperation with them in exchange for uh, the additional land we need and the well locations. Uh, we've got a complex group and you'll hear from Dan in a, a little bit, but obviously we've got a lot of folks working on this. And again, we're, we've minimized in-house staff and we're relying heavily on AECOM and Hazen as program managers. Moving the flow across uh, from Boat Harbor to Nanceman, obviously that's a, a, like a seven mile crossing of the Hampton Roads. That'll be uh, pretty exciting. Uh, we'll we'll yeah, well. a directional drill under the channel, and then we'll come up and we're um, in discussions, early discussions with uh, BMRC and others about open cut uh, in the bot river bottom and the shallower parts once we get out of the channel uh, going towards Nansman. So here's this part is going under the channel, and that would be some direct uh, or uh, some boring or um, directional drill and then we'd come up and this would be still under the channel bottom but it would be open cut through the shallow parts uh, and then ultimately we're on land 
through part of Suffolk and come over to the treatment plant. So pretty uh, massive engineering undertaking to move flow off of Boat Harbor, but uh, it's a really tight site. There's no room for anything else there, and uh, we really need to move it over to Nansman if we want to do the advanced treatment. And uh, in addition, we, we evaluate going back up the peninsula, and it would just be too disruptive and too expensive to take that flow all the way back up to the James River treatment plant. So um, this was actually the lowest cost alternative. This is about $150 million project to make that crossing. Again, there's the overall schedule. That gets you up to date with where we're at and what we're looking at. So again, first water in the ground, 2026 time frame, uh, James River, uh, next at York River in 2028. And then 2031 is the two big facilities at Nansman and BIP. And somewhere around uh, 2033, we'd be putting water in the ground at Williamsburg. So Dan's going to show how we've refined the modeling with that schedule to see what the reaction is to the groundwater as a result of that. So um, any questions on SWIFT schedule and what we're doing and where we're going? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and let Dan pick his screen up. All right, let me try, uh, try and get this. And now that we know more, we've got refined model and refined dates. We really wanted to, to really run impact of swift recharge on the groundwater to really understand what's happening. There we go. Everybody see that? Yeah, it's there, Dan. Okay. See if I can do this. Make it as big as possible. There we go. All right. So uh, I I don't know how much um, time I have here. I won't I won't take too long. But I'll um, uh, we'll go over the purpose of the modeling, um, some of the background, um, our modeling process, the scenarios we look at, and then we'll get into the results. Um, I always like to give some context on the background, just in case there are folks that this group should be pretty well pretty well. Uh, studied up on the, the aquifer system here, but just in case, it's always good, good to have that. So let's see here. The, uh, uh, for the purpose, uh, you know, we can look at, um, and we have piloted and we have even demonstrated now um, that we can treat the water to the standards we need to, and that we can put the water in the ground and that we can make the water uh, from SWIFT uh, compatible from a geochemistry point of view, that we don't send um, things we don't want um, off in the water as it goes across the aquifer, and that, and that we don't um, damage the aquifer clays and, and cause our own, cause a failure to even be able to put the water in the ground. Um, but even with all of that, that doesn't really kind of help us view into the future and see what the impact of SWIFT is. So use this groundwater modeling to estimate what the impact of the SWIFT uh, recharge will be on the aquifer system. Uh, it's a very complicated aquifer system. It may not seem like that after I start talking about it, but I tend to dumb it down a little bit. Just, just an easy way to see it in an ideal model sense. But it is a three-dimensional thing, and it's, it is complicated. It's not just a, a simple spreadsheet accounting kind of system here. Um, there's a lot of gazintas and there's a lot of kamatas. And so um, it really does take a, a numerical model of some complexity to really look at this and look into the future. And we're lucky that we already had one on hand, um, largely because of this group right here uh, uh, pushed to get a model update, a very good model update, and by and large paid for it as well. So we're glad to be able to piggyback on that tool and use it here. The, uh, the reason we're doing an update is that the initial modeling we performed was in 2014 and 2015. And so we didn't, it really wasn't even called SWIFT back then. Um, we were looking mainly at uh, kind of a conceptual fatal flaw analysis. As Ted mentioned earlier, it was seven plants back then that we were looking at seven SWIFT sites. Uh, we were really looking to see what the end, end outcome is um, in that model back then. So. We just threw the big switch and put them all on at once, 100% uptime, and we were interested in those outer year results. 
after we got those initial runs, uh, that's when uh, the DEQ uh, made some changes and initiated some groundwater permit reductions. So that changed some of the come out of, um, out of that model that we needed to, to look at. And then we also had some, some updates to, um, to some of the things about SWIFT that we understand, five sites now, as Ted showed in the previous slides. Um, we're looking at 75% recharge uptime that we have learned from the research center. Um, and we are, wanted to look at the early years as well as the outer years. So we wanted to put in that phase startup. You know, when you're looking at 50 years of a model run, that phase startup doesn't really mean a lot. But when you really want to look at what's going on, how do we change the picture in the groundwater? How do we change those water levels, those potentiometric surfaces um, over time? We really need to, to look in in those early years. And then, of course, we wanted the latest model calibration and we wanted the latest reported use withdrawals, latest permit amounts. So um, it was just time to do some updated runs. Enough, enough had changed. We wanted to look at it again. So I'm not advancing here. There we go. So just some back. Again, I won't belabor this. I know this group is pretty well educated on this, but I, I want to just touch on some things. Um, I know you know where you are, so uh, this isn't for that reason, but I, I just wanted to show the extent of the this coastal plain, northern coastal plain aquifer system. I mean, it's it's very prolific. Uh, this is a, a map on the left of from the USGS, from the Groundwater Atlas, and this is the Potomac aquifer. Um, and the colors are where the transmissivities uh, relates to the transmissivities that, that heat map. Um, and you can see here, Virginia. So the borders, the model really covers this area in green. Um, but uh, the, the, the aquifer really extends all the way up in New Jersey, um, all the way down South Carolina. So it's very extensive. Um, and you can see here, this was, uh, these are the seven sites we looked at at first, and we're dropping back to five now. And in here, you can see the trace of the Chesapeake Bay impact crater, which is explicitly um, coded into the model now. Before, it was kind of an implicit thing. We didn't know we didn't know there was a crater there, but we knew something was going on, and it turned up in the hydraulic properties. But now that there's a lot of research has been done, and we know that's a crater, so it's it's hard in the model now. Okay, so. Um, Again, just in case, uh, <clears throat> the uh, this coastal plain aquifer system that we're located in, uh, it's this wedge of sediments here, this, this uh, eastward dipping and eastward thickening wedge of sediments. So aquifers come in all different types. And, and for us, we're very lucky the way we have the aquifer system here, um, the way that uh, sediments were shed off of the Appalachian Mountains and were reworked here at the, at the coastal plain we've wound up with a series of layers that are coarser layers and finer layers and the coarser layers, the sand silts, I mean, excuse me, the sands, gravels and shells make up the aquifers and the finer grains, the silts and clay confining units. So we get a layer take, layer cake kind of geology and that's a results in a layer cake type of hydrogeology really. Um, and so we have all these different stacked aquifers horizontally. And so this is kind of important to get this 3D, 3D model in your head. This is the system we're dealing with. Um, the rock is deep where HRSD is. It's on average about 2,000 feet down to that rock. So everything, every building you sit in, in roads is floating on these soils. Um, and uh, let's see here. So if you, know, if you and I were, were standing out here by this, this well in this figure, um, you said, well, what, which aquifer is below us right now? And well, they all are. It depends on how deep you go. So they're stacked horizontally. And at the top is an unconfined aquifer because there is no confining unit. There's no shallower silt and clay layer on it. Um, and below are confined aquifers. So the other thing to think about with these aquifers is that they are hydraulically isolated from each other. Um, it, it's to varying degrees. Um, there are leaky confined aquifers. So we won't absolute about it but in terms of just our understanding right now think of these as separate vessels separate separate reservoirs in here that are hydraulically isolated so if we if we drilled several wells down where this one is and just screened or were open to these other aquifers we'd get different water quality likely and we get different 
bubbles, they all have their own pressurized water level. So we'll look at that a little bit more here. This is a uh, pretty popular schematic used um, to represent the coastal plain. This is from the fall zone up in Richmond uh, down the spine of the peninsula out to the bay and take a slice. This is this is typically how it's represented. And so you can put some names to some of these aquifers. This really is the, the other was just an ideal model of of a coastal plain situation. This is really our situation. And some things that jump out at me anyway are the you know the bedrock again it's deep it dives deep down here to get to the actual rock in place um the potomac aquifer is the biggest blue aquifer here um these other marine sediments are, are a lot thinner these aquifers um and so it's really doesn't beg the question you know why why are so many withdrawals out of the potomac there's just so much of it here and it's got a lot of capacity if you look at the right of the potomac aquifer then you see this big brown plug as the Exmoor uh, class confining unit. And this this is that bay impact crater. Uh, hit, hit above the mouth of the bay and exploded 35 million years ago, made a big hole. So everything that was nice and stratified running through here got mixed up like a blender and washed back down in this hole. And when you mix all these nice different size grains together like that, you wind up making something that's akin to to cement. I mean, it's not hard, but it water does not easily flow in and out of in and out of this crater. And um, to illustrate that, I, I think you know that the USGS, I believe, it was USGS took they they put a, a few cores down into this crater, and they from one of the core samples retrieved, they pulled a pore water sample, and they dated it, and it dated to something like 120 million years old. So this water is very old. Um, it's it's the same water that was there when the crater hit in in some of these in some of these units that didn't get blasted to pieces where they pulled that water from. So um, it's old. The water here around Franklin Paper Mill was dated to forty thousand years old, something like that. So this water is old as well. And um, you know what you set up here again with these confined aquifers is uh, uh, that um, that. The rain that falls uh, on the on the surface there does not directly go straight down and reach. It takes a long time for water that falls on the surface here with this stack of aquifers and confining units between the Potomac and the surface for that water to make it down here. So the only place that the rainwater directly hits into the Potomac and recharges it is up here at the fall zone. So that's that's kind of what sets up this situation where we start to mine groundwater. It takes a long time for that water to get down there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about hydraulics in the coastal plain aquifer system. I think that helps too. It can get confusing when you're thinking of terms like water levels and you have all these aquifers stacked on top of each other. Um, and I don't want to confuse anybody. And if you're used to dealing with this, it can be confusing. So let's take first the example of that, that surficial aquifer, the one on the very top. Um, we'd call it the water table, water table aquifer. Um, so the blue in here, the solid blue, represents the saturated zone of that cube of aquifer that's been pulled out. And so you have the top of that water, the water levels out here. It's it's this line here. When you put a well in and start pumping it at Q gallons a minute, you start dewatering the aquifer to supply that well. So so the water level in here, this is the same as it was before we started pumping. But as you get close to the well, the water level starts dropping the closer you get to the well. And in this ideal model here, uh, we're home, we've got homogeneous horizontal flow all the way around this well. And so what you end up with is a, a circle or a cone. We call that the cone of depression. And it's really where, in this case, it's really where the water in the aquifer for dewaters to fill that, to fill that uh, need, that pumping. Over in the confined aquifer, we have a similar thing going on, but a different thing. So if we look again, where the blue is, is where the aquifer is saturated. But this aquifer, like I said before, is under pressure. So think of it like a pipe in a distribution system. Um, and again, we've all seen the uh, we've all seen the car chase movies and car runs off and smashes into a fire hydrant and the water sprays high in the air. And the reason it sprays up in the air is because that water is under pressure. Um, and a lot of times that water might be under pressure because there's a storage tank of, you know, in some height above it. 
Well, this water is under pressure because those aquifers again are tilted. So there is water stored at a higher height than this. So that causes this to be under pressure. But the same phenomena happens. We punch it with a well, that water shoots up into the well. Um, and we can call it water level when it's in a well. When it's when it's not up in a well, when it's still in the aquifer, we call it a potentiometric surface because it's a pressure surface. So what happens when we pump? Well, before we pump, that water rises up to a static water level that's equal with this, this dashed line here. And that's a, the water level in the well would be up here and the pressure in that aquifer beside it would be up here. When we start pumping, we pull that water level in the well down and we pull the pressure down around the well and it's lower, closer you are to the well. And so we get the same phenomena. It's just not that it's just not dewatering the aquifer. It's, it's depressurizing the aquifer. And so again, we get a cone of depression. And because we're in a pressurized situation, this Q can be the same, but the, the pressure drop is felt a lot further. Again, it's like a distribution system. When you, you flow a hydrant, you can feel that pressure drop some, some distance away. Um, so it's the same, same idea here. And so now if you can imagine, and this is the part that gets confusing, this part's easy. It, it starts to get confusing if you're not used to dealing with this and you start thinking about stacked aquifers and we talk about water levels and different aquifers that are on top of each other. And you just have to think of them as separate hydraulic systems. So we, we're totally going to talk about one aquifer at a time and its water level if we're talking about a well and its potentiometric or pressure surface if we're, if we're talking about the aquifer in general. So this is an expression of that pressure surface in the Potomac Aquifer on a map view. Um, and this is from a 1982 publication. I got this when I was in uh, undergraduate in a hydrogeology course. And I said, man, that's where I live. I was up at James Madison. I said, hey, that's where I live. Um, but this is, the, this is the Potomac Aquifer, and it shows these pumping centers where the wet paper mills are. There's one over here in North Carolina. Again, the, the aquifer does not obey the political boundaries we have. Um, and, it, and implicitly, again, in 1982, they didn't know there was a crater, but you can see the manifestation here. And these, it's pretty interesting to see it. Over here, this is 2009, the same pumping centers. Um, the crater is explicit over here. And you can, you can see the kind of trough of depression that's developing from the pumping here. And these are, these are again, you know, we talked about uh, those ideal models, um, how everything was pretty homogeneous, that horizontal flow. And you can see that the coastal plain aquifer system here, I've had some of our senior modelers say, you know, it's amazing how Tice-like, or in, in other words, how homogeneous that horizontal flow can be in these aquifers. These are very, very uh brown conical cones of depression. I mean, they're very symmetrical almost. There's there's some asymmetry to it, but it is amazing um, how well they, they represent that. So we've talked about the coastal plain environment we're in. We've talked about um, groundwater flow to the wells and what these different, when we talk about water levels or potentiometric surfaces, what that means. So now let's look at the model itself. Um, the model, it takes what we do to, to create a model here, numerical models, we take a conceptual model, which has everything we just talked about, um, and some more details, some, some hydraulic properties, the boundary conditions like that, that basement rock, confining units, um, no flow boundaries, lateral flow boundaries into the states that are near us, um, uh, the well withdrawals. We put all everything we know about the aquifer, we take that and we translate it into computer code. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit this is a concept as well. This isn't the code. This is the concept of the code. But, but this, this, uh, this kind of lets you know how that gets turned into, into that model. Um, the model is made up of a bunch of grid cells. And uh, the layers in, th in this model here, we could think of this layer one as being the first aquifer maybe. Layer two is the second. Layer three is the third. And equations, governing equations, are, are set up in these in these different uh, model cells to allow the model, the cells to talk to each other. So as you put a withdrawal in, the governing equations tell the cells next to it how to react, what to what to calculate in terms of flow and pressure. Between in this certain model right here, between the layers, there's equations that represent the confining units. So that's how we turn what we what we found in the field and what we know from all our exploration 
into a, a model we can use and run it. And so we take that model and we give it some stimulation and then we look at the output and, and see how the system behaves. This is a grid cell of the actual model we're using now. It's, uh, it's published, I apologize, background noise. It was published, uh, USGS put the model together in, in 2009, Haywood and Pope. Um, the previous model was from the RASA uh, series of models that the USGS did up and down the coast, regional aquifer system assessment, something like that. And they were really good models for the time. They were done, I think, in the 80s. Um, but again, this group, this Hampton Roads Planning District, uh, Directors of Utilities Committee, um, who's got a very vested interest in this groundwater situation, um, decided that model was too coarse. There were some there were some issues with it. It was a great tool, but its time had come and put resources and a scope together that was administered by the by the PDC um, for the USGS to put this new model together. Um, so the grid cells on the old model were three miles on a side, which again at the time was really good resolution, but for what for permitting wasn't quite good enough. So the USGS, these grid cells are a mile, mile on a side, so a good bit better resolution. Um, they added the, the implicitly, I think instead of a layer for each aquifer, there's 60 layers in this model. So it's highly discretized. So one aquifer like the Potomac may take up 10 or 12 or however many layers um, that that geometry imposes on that grid system. Um, and they also added this density dependent uh, C watt uh, water migration. So you can see the, the seawater is just the density, but you can kind of think of it as the red is seawater and the, the blue is fresh water and the gradation is brackish, different degrees of brackish water. And DEQ then took that model that was created uh, and had their consultant Aquaveo uh, modify the model to be used in the groundwater permit program. So it's the model that's been being used in that permit program. That's the same one that we're using to, to evaluate SWIFT and regional impacts on SWIFT. So how do we do that? This is our model process here to get through with SWIFT. So we, we want to understand when we add SWIFT to the, to the groundwater setting here that uh, we have everything that that model has in it and that we have the withdrawals in it. We wanna know what's gonna happen, not just with SWIFT on its own, but again, it's a very complex system. There's, you know, the, you can't really model just the, just the recharge or just the withdrawals if you're gonna do recharge. You gotta model it all, it all impacts those cells are talking to each other and they're, they're, you know, whether they're withdrawing or recharging, they're, they're communicating back and forth. So we have to run our swift recharge scenarios against a baseline of withdrawal scenario. So we have two different types of withdrawal scenario. One type is the reported use. So what was actually used, and in this case, it's the 2018 report use. And then the other scenario is the total permitted reuse. So this one is a more realistic, in the near term. This is what folks argue. So a purveyor may be permitted for say four MGD and, and maybe they're only using, three. well, the three would be, you know, what would be in the 2018 use. The four would be what was in the total permitted use. So this total permit's more conservative in terms of withdrawals. And the 2018 is more realistic in the near term in terms of what's going on. Then we, then we run one of our swift recharge scenarios against uh, those withdrawal scenarios, each at a, on a, you know, separately. And then we go back and look at the before and after, like you, anything you're trying to assess the impact of. Before and after, and we look at the water levels or the potentiometric surface uh, before and after for each aquifer. Um, the Potomac in particular is what we're most interested in. And then we look at the critical surface impacts. And the critical surface is the regulatory threshold used by the DEQ to evaluate uh, the aquifer as a whole and evaluate each permit, applique, uh, permit applicant um, to determine whether technically that, that withdrawal they're requesting is viable. So I think of this 80% um, rule as uh, it's kind of like a, the dummy light in your car. So you're, you know, for the gas tank. So as you're going, um, you know, where that actually goes off is a little bit arbitrary, whether it should be at 80 or 70 or 90, that's all something that we could argue. But I think we all appreciate the light going off sometimes when we're not, maybe not paying attention to the gauge or we're trying to, to sneak by a little bit further. That light kind of 
puts a warning on all of us to, hey, you better go do something about this. Well, that's the same thing with this threshold criteria. It's a, it's a criteria that says, okay, if we're seeing these model cells trip that criteria, we may not be in, in bad situation yet, but, but that's an indicator where we've got to do something about that. Um, and I put this graphic together after it's not in a little packet that's out on Dropbox. I apologize, but I just thought if I'm going to talk about this rule, I ought to put something together to help explain it. But that threshold, that critical surface occurs 80% of the distance between ground surface and the top of the aquifer. So there's a different surface for each of those confined aquifers we look at. So uh, if you were looking at the Potomac aquifer, if this was the Potomac, this would be, that surface represents 80% of that distance, not to scale, sorry. Um, so in other words, if, if we looked at the potentiometric surface after making our model run, if you're a permit applicant, or if you're looking at the state of the aquifer in general and you just run a scenario um, for a given model cell in the Potomac that represents the Potomac, if the water level is above the surface, then we're okay um, in terms of the permitting and, and available water. Um, if it's below the surface, we're violating that threshold and there's an issue. So uh, let's look at the baseline scenarios. So on the left, we have the 2018 reported use scenario. And on the right, we have the total permitted, meaning the most recent total permits, uh, 2018 permitted amounts. And so what you see again, the heat map really helps. I love the graphics in this, these newer, later model programs. Uh, but you can see the heat map shows these cones of depression again near the, near the mills. They're the, they still are the, the single, uh, biggest withdrawals that show up. Um, but there's there's municipal withdrawals spread out through here and there, and you can see the impact there as well. There's not just isolated cones here. The reported use, you can see the difference in the two. This one is uh, more conservative in terms of withdrawal um, because you can see that there's actually that trough of depression again, and the crater does exacerbate that as well. I mean, it's this hard boundary that no, it's not feeding any water to help make up that withdrawal. Um, so that's just the way the way it is. Um, and so those are the two, those are the two different baselines on their own. And then we, our swift modeling scenarios, uh, again, all the model scenarios are used with this phase startup because again, we want to see how things change over time now. They're all, uh, all the swift sites are recharging at 75% of the target capacity because we realize now with the, with the, you know, we, again, when we did this initial models. These were, these were desktop. We hadn't gone any further than desktop. Uh, but we realize now having an aquifer, having an advanced water treatment plant, as with any treatment plant, there are times when things uh, go offline. There, there may be any number of reasons where um, there's some cause to stop recharging some percentage of the time. Something could come through the wastewater plant that is difficult for the advanced water treatment to treat or that we don't even want going through the advanced water treatment that we need to go to the outfalls. There's, there's any number of reasons. but. A uh, more realistic number seems to be 75% rather than 100%. We know that's not, that's really not good. Um, all the scenarios are transient, transient runs, so it's not a, it's not a steady state model run. There's time steps in here. So they run for 180 years. Um, and they extend really from, from 2020 into the future 50 years. So into 2070. Uh, all the seminar and all the scenarios are modeled under one of those, one of those withdrawal scenarios. So these are the scenarios. We looked at the 2018 reported use first, and then just put in with those conditions, a ramp startup as Ted was describing that schedule, we put that schedule in for startup and we put them at 75% of the capacity we're expecting. Um, and we did it the same thing with uh, total permitted scenario as the base, as the background scenario running, the withdrawal scenario, we looked at SWIFT. And then we looked at a couple of uh, twists on that theme um, because again, this is all connected and, um, it turns out, uh, that, you know, for SWIFT to, to continue to operate, um, the most effectively, it really withdrawals are a good thing. If we didn't have the withdrawals, we really couldn't do, couldn't do SWIFT. So, um, SWIFT puts water back into the system and makes it available. Um, so we wanted to look at two cases where permit reductions were, are on the horizon and we're, we're put into the, the latest permits 
um, that actually got into the actual withdrawals and said, okay, what if we were able to roll back the clock? Can SWIFT allow us to roll back the clock on those proposed cr cuts? Because they're, they're actually going to get into the pumping. Um, was it 14 largest users took, took reductions? And uh, I think all but three of those, the DEQ was uh, very conscious to try and optimize the reductions and do the best they could to avoid taking actual water that, that people had immediately planned to use and that were they were using. And so so all but three were were what we tended to call paper cuts. In other words, you had that situation where you may have been permitted to five and, and you're using three. And so DEQ says, all right, you're going to stay at three. We're not going to take that away, but you can't grow anymore. You can't go into that five. Um, well, for JCSA and for West Rock uh, Paper Mill, they, they went into their current pumping. Um, and said, okay, you got to, you actually have to come down. You have to find another source of water. So we wanted to look at, in, and that's part of looking at that early year, that, that uh, near term picture. So we'll go over those two. So scenario one, this is the reported use. So on the left, again, is the baseline, the one I showed you earlier. This is just withdrawals, reported use, kind of the current picture. If we took the pumping that's going on in 2018 and we just said, hold that pumping and run it to 2070, this is what the Potomac Aquifer water levels or potentiometric surface would look like. And then we said, okay, what if we put, what if we, what if we have, and then we also have SWIFT going at five SWIFT sites. And when we, when we do that, we get the, the picture on the right. And so the bluer colors, again, are recovery, and what we get is a mound of water here. And, and this is very consistent with the early results that we showed um, from the earlier modeling. Uh, over here is where we can look at that critical cell analysis. So the blue uh, blocks here are critical cells, and the yellow blocks are critical cells that violated that 80% criterion that I showed you earlier in that slide. So they violated, in this scenario, they violated that, uh, that critical threshold. And with the blue cells are actually now satisfied. So this shows you in one figure where there were violations, SWIFT has resolved those violations. And this is with reported use. So SWIFT does a few things here. Uh, just looking at this, this again is 2070. Um, but one thing that it does is help push the, the gradient back towards the ocean. So in terms of salt water coming on the field, this if you put a marble here on this surface, that marble is going to run down and, and into here, you know, around into here. If you put a marble over here, it's going to tend to run back towards the ocean, which is what you want with with salt water. So again, this is a pressure surface, but it's it's pushing that way. That pressure sets up to uh, to mitigate that salt water desire for that salt water to come onto the well field. So now the total permitted. So this is a more conservative view of the the pumpage. Um, it's higher pumping because everybody's at their total permitted now, and you can see that in the heat map. It goes, it pulls into the, again, a trough here. Um, and again, if you put a bunch of marbles in, they're all going to roll back kind of reverse gradient from what, what for naturally wants to do is go out to sea. Um, uh, and so, uh, the right, this again is with the swift. And so what you get is, um, again, this is a total, this is a, a more dire situation in terms of critical cell threshold violations. And that is, Again, because this is a more, a more conservative withdrawal scenario, but SWIFT, um, the SWIFT does resolve these cells. And, and, it, and the ones near the fall zone, don't get hung up on those. They're unresolved. But this is where, that, this is where the, the Potomac Aquifer outcrops. And so, again, when you look at some of the surface down to the top of the aquifer, this is the top of the aquifer. So it, it doesn't, that equation breaks down there. So now these are the scenarios where we roll back West Rock and, J, uh, and JCSA to their to prior to the reductions on their total permitted. So let's just look at the maps here. Um, this is the baseline again. Um, total permitted, total permitted this time on the baseline, the more conservative. And this is with SWIFT with JCSA and West Rock. Without those permit cuts, they're at the 2014 permit amounts. So you can see that you get the same benefits. You're always going to have tons of depression there because they're big withdrawals. But you can see that the critical cells are satisfied. Um, 
this is again this is this one on the right is uh is without the the reductions this one on the left is with the reductions and there's some nuances that are a little different but they are materially identical um so that that's kind of the big takeaway here is on the total permitted the, the more conservative withdrawal system here uh these these are materially identical whether you cut into their current pumpage or you don't cut into their current pumpage on the model in the model world um swift resolves the issue the other thing to notice here is that these critical cells don't occur right over ip and they, they don't occur over west rock or at at jcsa's wells um so let's look at um this is the reported use scenario this is with swift and reported use and here again is a comparison of with the cuts and without the cuts. And again, they're very close to the same results in the model. Um, all right, so now let's look, um, so that, you know, some of the conclusions we can draw is that the SWIFT is still the kind of the single biggest uh, benefit. And, and I don't want anybody to interpret what I'm saying as, as uh, anything close to pointing to DQ and saying they're derelict of duty. They have. They have done a tremendous job, in my opinion, of trying to work through a very complex problem um, that they uh, that they tried to get ahead of and, and found out that what they put in place in the 92 or, or 97, whatever it was, didn't quite work. And, they, and they, um, that's a very tough spot to be in when their biggest hammer really is permit reductions. I mean, that's that's all they really have. Um, but it, this does show that SWIFT really allows the water levels to recover. And it takes care of the critical cells, um, and it does so even if GCSA and West Rock are at their former uh, amounts. So it's it's when we want to look in temporally, that's a those were static shots, from map view, seventy years, fifty years in the future from now. Um, but we want to look at some of this temporal component. Um, again, we look at where the critical cells were were failing in the total permitted scenario. Is not right over top of IP, but that's where we want to look. We don't want to look at JCSA and at West Rock. They they never got into a critical state. Um, so we picked a cell that that tripped during both the reported use and the the total permitted, and we want to look at the hydrograph here. And so what you're looking at here is ground surface here, the top line. Um, you're looking at the potentiometric surface in this model cell. This is one model cell. And then right here is where we start splitting off into our different scenarios. And so here is the total permitted. So you get this to this impact. It goes from reported use to total permitted. So it draws down and then nothing really changes. It, it reaches asymptotic. It dives a little bit. But so what DEQ did with the reductions did stabilize. Um, here's reported use. And if you carry that into the future, you kind of get this stabilized. This blue line here is that critical surface. This is the real dummy like level in the tank. And these are both SWIFT scenarios. These are scenarios for reported use. And these are scenarios of SWIFT with the total permitted. And what you see is the, the uh, reported use and the permitted really are the, the two big differences here. Um, it's not whether JCSA and West Rock are at the previous permitted amount or at their current. You can barely tell the difference when these are overlain. A little bit easier way to look at it. And this is at that cell that violates the critical surface. So another thing to look at here, I said we want to look at the temporal picture. Um, here we are in 2020, and as we go forward, you know, it doesn't take 50 years to get above this critical threshold. Um, this is the, the reported use, and this is probably closer to closer to what is would be the case because it's highly unlikely everybody would would throw down to their total permitted use um too quickly and get and get us over here but but it's probably somewhere in between here that the actual scenario would happen but probably closer to reported use so you you think somewhere in 2020 by 2020 i don't know 2025 2026 27 as we start implementing i guess 26 and on as we implement swift we pretty quickly get out of this bad territory um, for total permitted, it takes longer. But again, that's if the total permitted hits. Even then, by say 2038 with SWIFT, we're out of that, we're out of that critical territory. And this is just a bit closer with some labels, so you can, you can see it up close a little bit 
bit easier. Um, and so we look at the uh, the temporal impact is is pretty much the same with or without the 2014 permit reductions for these two users. The magnitude of the benefit with SWIFT is about the same. Uh, again, I use the word materially identical, um, whether the reductions are in place or they're not in place for these two. Um, so we can look at this as the cell at JCSA again. They're not anywhere close to at their at the pumping center. They're not close to the critical surface, but the behavior of the the recovery is the same across. You, know, you can pick these different areas in the aquifer, different model areas, and, and you get the same basic recovery. This is a rock mill. And again, the, the critical surface doesn't even show up on this graph. It's at 257 feet down. So um, this is IP that's a little bit closer there, but it's still, it's still not the problem. So again, uh, you know, we get we get good recovery with SWIFT. SWIFT still seems to be the biggest impact um, in the modeling we've done. Uh, you get that S-shaped recovery, whether you have JCSA and West Rock at their previous amounts or their current uh, reductions. Um, and you can see that even with the phase startup. So I, I don't want to take up any more time. If there are any questions, though, I'll take them. And Ted can help me. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. yeah. I think the intent was just to show that, you know, it's not a 50 year wait and we do see recovery and that the, the cuts that we knew about for James City and um, West Rock you know, can be recovered either way, that they don't make a big difference. So the idea was to try to show clearly that there's an argument to get more time before any long term decisions are made on on those cuts and everything was done for this permit cycle and Doug could comment to that or not, but you know, we're trying to race to, to show that, you know, maybe it needs another permit cycle before any um, draconian moves are made by DEQ on a permanent basis. Yeah, I've, I've said this to you before, I guess, in other forums, but yeah, I, I mean, this, this modeling is very helpful and very encouraging. So I appreciate it. And I do expect that it'll lead to further conversations. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting DEQ included some of this in their um, water state water resources plan update. And uh, but we think Scott said, or whoever was presenting that they felt like the model might overstate the water level recovery of SWIFT. And um, they're just being really cautious. So I think when that plan comes out, it might be worth looking at the assumptions um, I mean, it's probably their job to be conservative, but it might be in y'all's best interest to um, push them to be realistic if it means, uh, you know, being able to avoid, you know, developing new water sources that we may not really need. Um, so we'll just think of it in that terms when we get to that next stage. And uh, also um, the uh, Eastern Virginia Ground Groundwater Advisory Committee is going to start meeting again. I think it's October 22nd. I know a couple of y'all are on it, but we will uh, keep an eye on that and see what, um, you know, what initiatives they're going to uh, look at. I, I don't know too much about the agenda for that group yet. So, let's see. For whatever it's worth, I'm on that committee. Yeah. I think, uh, I think Chesapeake's on it too and HRC, so keep an eye on it. And the agenda, I think, I, we just got something from Scott during this meeting. Uh, just had a question for Ted on the previous uh, presentation. When do you anticipate the crossing for the Boat Arbor, um, sorry, yeah, Boat Arbor Advanced Nutrient Facility, that crossing of the channel, when do you foresee that happening? So our goal is to close that plant by the end of calendar year 2025, um, for more for TMDL reasons than uh, nutrient or, or for our SWIFT reasons. But um, so we're on a fast track to get there. So um, that, you know, we're, we're moving quickly now to get to the point where we have uh, bridging documents for a design build contract RFP uh, next year. And we're gonna have to get that selected pretty fast to make that happen. It's um, 
obviously very complicated okay. project. So again, the goal is have it done and pumping flow by the end of 2025. Great, thank you, Ted. All right, well, I'll keep moving along. Um, hey, Katie, can you bring up the um, customer assistance slides? Um, so I just wanted to do um, two sort of updates. We've kind of moved under the uh, round table discussion. One, um, if you all haven't been watching the um, General Assembly stuff, it might be worth one more push on the, uh, the sort of uh, utility repayment plan stuff because um, there's amendments from both the House and the Senate on the budget. And in terms of the utilities piece, it still says that you have to provide repayment programs that don't include um, fees or interest charges. And I know that was something that people were not happy about. And it still has some reporting requirements even for the public water and uh, wastewater system. So um, I don't know if you have an active legislative liaison, you might wanna ask them to, to keep an eye on those things. And um, then the other thing I wanted to, to just circle back to as I sent this email out back um, at the beginning of September, we talked about tracking assistance programs. Um, I realized after I, I looked at it today that maybe it wasn't clear enough about sending data. Um, Katie, if you'll go to the next slide, you know, we were just gonna try to get a handle on how your programs were going that were sort of tied to the pandemic. And so that as this sort of issue may develop and maybe the next general assembly session comes into play and they, they want to tweak things we'd have some data but all i've heard i've only heard from suffolk and chesapeake um, suffolk said um, as of september 15th they had had 154 applications and 78 were approved for about thirty four thousand dollars. and chesapeake um, i've gotten two updates the most recent one says that um 18 applications have been approved for about um, ten thousand dollars so um, if anybody else can provide this data i I got a call from the Portsmouth person I thought collecting it, but, she, but I never got any data. And um, so it would be helpful, I think, to have a little bit more uh, information moving forward. If you have it, please. Uh... So um, any questions on that before we move to the next thing? Whitney, uh, for Newport News, uh, we, we, we do have the data. Uh, it's about, it's been about $55,000 for uh, the, the dollar value and about 139 applicants. However, um, that $55,000 includes not only water, but also sewer and uh, solid waste. And it's only for Newport News residents. We're serving five jurisdictions, but this is just for Newport News residents. And uh, it's hard to say whether uh, applicants are being approved or rejected. It's just that it, the process is slow enough that I know that right now a third, uh, no, actually less than that, probably about less than 20% have been received back into uh, the water side. And so we've, we've made the difference between what was water and what was sewer and solid waste. But are you interested in just the overall, like say uh, Suffolk says, you know, $34,000, is that purely water or is that the, would that include also the wastewater side of things? I think it includes both. And if you just note that, I, I'm starting to appreciate how hard it is to get really detailed data. But um, if it's, as long as it's utility relief versus like um, like a mortgage or rent and things oh, like yeah. that, I think it would be helpful. Okay. We'll try to keep it simple. I'll, I'll send you that detail later today. Whitney, watch your word, your words there because we're spending in Chesapeake a lot more on electric bills than we are on water and sewer bills. I don't know why, but they're it's just the way it's been. Electrical utility payments have been almost three times what water has been. All right. So ideally, yes, we would we would not include electrical because you're right that two things. It's high. It's also the private utility and I think there's a different sort of view sometimes on how that should be managed. Thanks. All right. Um, well, I will 
hand this off to Ted. He was gonna he's gonna give us an update on his repayment uh, plans. Um, please shoot me any questions you have on this uh, data tracking stuff. All right. We'll see if the oh you're getting faster at the screen sharing. Oh, you're on mute. Well, since I can't figure out where the where my controls went on the screen, we'll just do that. So, um, very quickly, this is uh, hopefully quickly. This is a a third party that we've um, we were pointed to by San Francisco that's um, trying to make it really easy for people to set their own payment plans up. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up to y'all because um, we're not going to do this obviously in any of the combined billing localities yet. But we're trying to roll this out uh, to our customers. So that would be the customers in Newport News, Virginia Beach, and Portsmouth who get just an HRSD bill. Uh, the intent of this program is really just to make it really easy for people. Hey, Ted, you're yeah. muted again. Oh, I know. Back. I just I trying to get the controls back. I got them. Okay. Now I can now I should be able to talk. So the intent of this group is really just try to make it easy to get folks to pay their bills and they um their origin was really in the uh corrections area around folks that had unpaid fines and things in california and la and uh, they found that if they made it easy by reaching out to them through various uh, mobile mechanisms and set up payment plans that an amazing number of folks would actually start paying their bills and some a really large number paid the entire balance that was due. So essentially they're just a, um, they'll sit on top of our customer service platform. They'll get information from our customer accounts. They'll be reaching out uh, various ways to get a hold of folks. And then they'll um, basically let them set up their own payment plan. They'll send reminders. We have no idea if this will work. Um, but it's it's a fairly low cost way to make it convenient to have our folks um, maybe start paying back without having to um, wait for them to reach out to us. Um, we're going to go to them instead. So we just felt like we needed to do something on our growing receivables in the near term uh, while we wait for both the General Assembly or the budget or whatever language comes along on shutoffs. And so this gives them a lot of ability to pay by some of these uh, application here, the, you know, Venmo, Apple Pay, a variety of payments that we don't normally take. Um, there's a small transaction fee. In this case, it was 250. It's going to be somewhere in that, that range. I think HRSD for our customers, at least during this COVID response, we're going to eat the cost of the transaction fee. Uh, but we think we would transition long term if we keep this uh, around after COVID that we would put that on the customer for the convenience of being able to do this. So they get text messages to remind them that they've got a payment due. They get um, text messages thanking them that they're in the plan. Um, they can update their own schedule. They can do a variety of things on, on how they're going to do it. Um, so this is just walking you through some screenshots of what that looks like. So, and they can manage their account. Um, and so this provides a lot of things that we don't have on our current mobile application for folks to pay their bill. And um, we have no idea, again, if this is really going to make a difference. But, but the reminders and the, op the what their experience has been in this company has been that when you make it really easy, you provide a lot of reminders and put it in their hands, um, some percentage of those people that haven't paid their bill do. And so anything's better than nothing, and that's kind of our approach. So. You may hear about this for your customer care folks, but again, we're not going to do this on any of the combined billing until we've proven the concept on our own, and then we'd reach out to you to figure out um, who else wants to be interested. So uh, that's just a quick snapshot of what we are doing in case you hear something about that. Hey, Ted, other than the uh, convenience charge, was there a cost to you for this company to come in and do this for you and um, you know, what kind of, I guess, time from your staff did it take to set this up? 
Yes, well, one, it's not set up yet, Aaron. They're working on it. Um, we're waiting on, you know, our CCMB upgrade seems to always drive everything. So the CCMB upgrade goes live next week. And then after that, they'll be working on making all the connections they need to. But yeah, there was a cost. Um, it's $30,000 for us to get this up and running. And we paid for that. We don't expect probably to have it really fully functional till close to the end of the year. All right. Any more questions? Can't tell. <coughs> yes, I'm on a, a different subject. Do you have an update on the uh, York River treatment plant uh, repair? Uh, we've still we've got a ways to go. We've got the we've got a, a, a pretty elaborate temporary pump around uh, in place. Can handle up to thirty five mgd, um, which would take most any rainstorm. You know that's a fifteen mgd plant, uh, but there is potential that if we got another hurricane Sally type deal or something else, Matthew or any of the major storms that might run into trouble again. But uh, so it's a 60 inch pipe that runs from our headworks to the uh, distribution box that spreads it into the primary clarifiers. And it basically uh, all needs to be replaced. So we're working with uh, TA Sheets or Bridgman Civil now to um, go ahead and do an emergency replacement of that. So we've got the bypass pumping in place to allow us to do that and um, as fast as they can get the materials and get it in the ground we'll be making that repair you know, bob was just asking if there's plans to, to extend that program to the combined bills um, if it works well we'd definitely be reaching out to the folks with combined bills and see if um, if there's interest and figure out how to make that happen there's lots of complications because I know you all have your own uh, restrictions on payment plans and how you make those work. And so right, right. it becomes infinitely more challenging when we start working with the combined bill. Right. And I, I fully agree with you. Anything is better than nothing. <laughs> That's, that, was, that was our intent here because we just saw, you know, another three, four, five, six months of not collecting, not shutting off was going to just create this disaster. So. We're also going to send a letter out um, to all of our customers in arrears, just reminding them that this isn't going to go away. That that just because they're not paying doesn't mean at the end of this we're going to write it off. So we're working on that exact communication. But essentially, it's hey, we understand a lot of you are in financial struggling, but you know if you start making any kind of payment, that'd be good because at some point when you know we're past the COVID disaster, we're going to start shutting people's water off for non payment. And it's, you know, there's no magic funding that's going to take this off of their uh, their credit list. So yeah, we're going to be trying to find the right words to communicate with them um, in the near future. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And this kind of reminds me of an old conversation about um, having like an automatic, like an auto call people if they are behind. D does HRSD do that for the combined bills? We don't do outbound calling yet. I think Virginia Beach does outbound calling, but. Yes, that's right, Ted, we do. I'm not sure how well that's working, Bob. You know, your receivables are growing pretty big by the time they're. <laughs> yes, we, we do have the um, outbound dialing, but we haven't been using it to send those types of um, of messages yet. I think we're all struggling to try to figure out something to do here. It's not a pretty picture. Well, I uh, I know we're we're getting we've moved to the two hour mark, which is a little bit unusual lately. So, um, I I think I missed the Tuesday call, but I will make sure in two weeks we'll have that, and um, maybe we could revisit this issue if y'all want to talk a little bit about the numbers and the strategies. Um break up these conversations. And uh, we didn't really have anything else. It just um, a couple of reminders, as you can see, we're still looking for groundwater MOAs and um, 
I, I think it was clear, but just um, to remind you, I did submit the comments on the state uh, DPOR um, proposal to, to sort of stop regulating the backflow prevention workers. So that got put in the mix. Thanks for everybody's quick response. Um, so does anybody else have a question for the group or a topic before we wrap up? Whitney, um, just a quick question. What is to expect a time to get the groundwater MOA finalized? Uh, we sent ours uh, about a week ago, but I wanted to know if this is something that's still going to be done before the end of the year or not. Uh, that was our hope was to have it wrapped up by the end of the calendar year. Um, that's when it officially expires. So we'd like to have it renewed, but um, it's going to be tricky. We've only gotten four so far. So uh, <laughs> I guess do your best. We can always, um, you know, backdate it or whatever. It, it, it's not the end of the world, but that's the goal. <laughs> hey, Whitney, one, one last quick comment is that um, if you, I don't know that it'll make the news over here at any point in time, but uh, Accomack County and Northampton County have now been added to HRC's territory. So oh. we're moving across the wire. You weren't busy enough. Wow. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, all right. Last call. Anybody? All right. Well, thank you all for sticking with us and joining us today. And I'll talk to you in two weeks. All right. Thank you. Katie. Hi. Just trying to get the recording stopped.